All right, good morning, everybody. This is the Macro Church of Christ Wednesday, Samuel the Chronicle study. We're in 1 Kings chapter 8 is where we're at today. And before we get started, we're going to let Albert lead us in a prayer. Sorry. Father, we thank you, Lord, for having shown us mercy, having been gracious unto us. We pray, Lord, that even as your word comes unto us, O Lord, let your word perform everything, O Lord, that you have said in your word, your word does. We pray that feed us with your word and strengthen us in our faith. Cause us to walk, O Lord, upright in you until you come. We pray, Lord, and commit our burden. We are not also able to join us because of one thing or the other, or because of weakness in the body, that, Lord, you be with them for our world and the other, and minister unto them all. To the glory of your holy name, Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so we are in 1 Kings chapter 8. Remember, if you would, the little charts that you have that I, that I gave you on 1 Kings. Uh, 1 Kings, if you notice, the first 11 chapters or 12 chapters talked about uh, Solomon's reign. And then the kingdom gets divided in chapter 12, and that, that we'll be talking about that. But right now, we're in the middle of this temple building, and we're going to talk about the dedication of the temple today. Uh, and then re remember that 1 and 2 Kings is also the same as first as second chronicles so second chronicles is the second second uh, recording of of first and second kings and it also deals with the kingdom and the dividing of the kingdom and then we'll look at that when we need to and then remember that i gave you the, the last little chart that you have also that deals with the charts of the kings, and we'll be looking at that a little bit later. And so that's what we're looking at today. And so if you would uh, open up your lessons, and we're finishing up chapter lesson 16, and we're going to get into chapter 17. And I believe we answered the questions for 16, didn't we? Oh, we didn't? Have we answered the questions for 16? I thought we did so. Yeah, we did, we did those last week that we answered those questions that were in there. They had to do with Solomon's alliance with Hiram, the, the labor projects that he had, the building of the temple, and then the other construction projects that Solomon has. And so now we're in, in chapter eight, which is going to deal with the building and the dedicate, dedicating of the temple, because we had it built in the last section. And this section, he's going to be talking about uh, dedicating it. And uh, you might remember that because it's also going to be, we're going to talk about it on Sunday sermon, because we just happen to be in John chapter 10 and down at verse 22, where it talks about that time period was during the dedication of the temple. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. So I uh, have that there for you as well. But let's take a look then. We're in 1 Kings. We're in 1 Kings chapter 8, where we're going to be talking about basically the dedication of the temple and the bringing in of the ark. Remember that in, in chapter seven, Solomon built the temple and he furnished the temple. And we had all that, all that uh, kind of uh, rough details of the furniture and of all the structure that's in the temple and the various things that he made. And so in chapter eight, we're now gonna notice, uh, well, I, I, let me see, I think it's chapter. Yeah, okay. So in chapter 8, verse 1, it says, uh, Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the father, father's household of the sons of Israel, to King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the city of David, which is Zion. So they're getting ready to bring the, the, the temple or the, the Ark of the Covenant up. So the temple had been built, but the Ark of the Covenant had, yet, had not yet been placed in it. And remember, the Ark of the Covenant represents God's presence. Uh, that's what the Ark of the Covenant represents. It represents the mercy seat of God or the place where you go to in order to find uh, favor with God. And so it says that uh, in verse 1, all the men and the households of the sons of Israel. So when you're talking about God, it's something that involves everybody, not just, not just a few people, not just leaders, but it involves everybody. And so in verse 2, it says, all the men of Israel assembled themselves to King Solomon at the feast in, in the month uh, Ethanim, 
which is the seventh month. Then all the elders of Israel came and the priests took up the ark and they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tent of meeting and all the holy utensils, which were in the tent and the priests and the Levites brought, brought them up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled to him were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen, they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priest brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to the place into the inner sanctuary of the house to the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim for the cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark and the cherubim made a covering over the ark and its poles from above but the poles were so long that the ends of the poles would be seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary but they could not be seen outside they are there to this day and there was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone, which Moses had put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the sons of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it happened that when the priest came from the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud or the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And so here you have them setting up the, the, the temple and getting it ready for, for God to occupy it. And uh, notice that uh, in verse 3, it says, Then all the elders of Israel came and the priests took up the ark. So, so they, they had the priests do it. Remember the last time that they moved the ark, or when David moved the ark, they had problems moving the ark. Who remembers why? Well, it was stolen, yeah, but that's not why David had problems bringing the ark back. Who remembers why David had problems bringing the ark back? Yep, the, the, the fact was that they put on a cart, and then Uzzah stretched out his hand because it was going to fall, and God struck him dead. And so they, it said that day David became afraid of God because he didn't know why God had struck uh, Uriah dead. But then he read in the law that it required the priests, only the Levites were allowed to move the ark. And so that's why here in this section, you have all the elders of Israel came and the priests took up the ark. So it was the priests who took up the ark. So they understood that it had to be moved in a certain way. And, and certainly that's something that, that uh, we can take a lesson from. And that is that you and I are, are God's priests and you and I are the ones that are supposed to bring the ark to other people. We're supposed to bring this this message of salvation to others. That message of salvation can't come to others by some unknown uh, uh, person who doesn't know or have a relationship with God. Now, in uh, uh, 1 Kings 8 and verse 4, it says, they brought up the ark of the Lord in the tent of meeting and all the holy utensils which were in the tent and the priests and the Levites brought them up. And so, so there you see all of the, the, the utensils that were gonna be used in the, in the temple. And again, it says the priest brought them up and King Solomon in verse five, along with the congregation were set, uh, assembled to him and were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. So they were having this great uh, uh, sacrifice as that was going on and so many that they couldn't be numbered. So that had to be quite a few because one of the numbers that it mentions a little bit later on is like 200,000 uh, oxen or, or sheep or sacrifices were done. And here it says that they couldn't even number these. So it kind of makes you wonder how big they were if they couldn't number this one. But then verse eight says, and, uh, then the priest brought, brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place into the inner sanctuary of the house to the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim. And, and so remember those cherubim that, that Solomon had made that were on the wall in the Holy of Holy? Remember the Holy of Holy is, is this part here, and then you have the holy place here, but right here along the wall, you had the angels with their wings that touched. Remember the cherubim? So they're putting the ark right here. So they're putting the ark right there underneath or in, in view of the, of the angels that minister to God, <clears throat> and, and so they put them under, under the cherubim there. And then it says in verse 7, that the cherubim uh, spread their wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim made a covering over the ark and his poles from, from above. 
but the poles were so long that the ends of the poles could, could be seen from the holy place. So probably what that means is, remember this was a curtain here. It probably means that the poles that were used to carry the ark were so long that they kind of maybe made a, a dent in the curtain so that you know it looked like the curtain had a bump there. And so that's maybe, maybe one of the reasons they did that was because nobody was supposed to go in there to see if the ark was around. And so nobody would know if the ark was still in there until the Day of Atonement. But if the, if the uh, poles were, were popped out a little bit like that, then they would know that there was a temple or that there was an ark in there. And so maybe that's one of the reasons God made them so long, because God did make them long. And so one of the things that that tells us is that God wants us to know that he's around. God, God's not trying to hide himself, even though you and I can't see God. And even though they couldn't see God clearly, at least the Ark of the Covenant, there was evidence from God that, that he was still there. There was a way to be able to know that he was there. And today, God's up in heaven. You and I can't see him. But God's given us evidence that he's here. God get, has given us evidence that he exists. Uh, and so we can't see God clearly right now, at least not physically. So we have to believe the evidence that he gives us. And so that's that's, I would suggest to you, maybe also one of the reasons why um, this was mentioned here, that they bring him under the, the wings of the cherubim and the poles were sticking out in verse 8 from the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen outside. Uh, they, they are there to this day. And so what's interesting is he says the priests that worked in here where you had the showbread, where you had the candlestick in here, in Solomon's there was, I think, five candlesticks, I don't remember, but they were basically one, and the pattern was there, and they had a number of tables for the showbread, but what's interesting is you could see it from in here, so if you're in there, you could see it, in other words, you could see the presence of God, now, who are these guys here, those are priests, so who can see that God's around, even though you can't really see God, the priests, who today believes that there's a God and that we know he exists. Priests, Christians, we're Christians. The world doesn't believe God's out there. The world doesn't see the evidence of God, but you and I do. And so you and I are in here and we can see the evidence of God, but the people out in the world, they ignore it. They reject it. They, they don't want to see the evidence of God. When they do see the evidence of God, they will probably become priests because that's what happens with you. That's what happened with you and I. When you and I understood that we were, that there was a God and we needed to obey him, then we became part of his family. Bill? Right. So, so God, God wants to make himself known to us, but he's, he's not a three-dimensional being. You and I are three-dimensional beings. We have height, depth, and width. God's not a three-dimensional being. I, I, maybe he's a four, five, six, seven-dimensional being. I, I don't know. Maybe, there are, maybe there's really no dimensions where God's at. I, I, don't, I don't know. But he's not like us. So therefore, for him to manifest, it, he, for us to know he's there, he has to manifest himself to us. And I'd suggest to you that that's part of probably what's going on there when it talks about that those poles were, could, could only be seen from the sanctuary. Now, verse 9 says, the, uh, uh, there was nothing in the ark except the, the two tablets of stone which Moses put, put there at Horeb. Now, what had been in the ark? Well, the, the, ta the tablets, the Ten Commandments, a bowl of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. So remember that the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant. And so maybe it's possible that while they had it, they took out the rod or they took out the manna. But the manna and the, and the uh, rod weren't in there. Okay, the only thing that was in there was the Ten Commandments. So again, you have the, the uh, primary natural way that God dealt with his people, and that is according to law. He, the, the, the law is in the Ark of the Covenant. And so the law is inside here. Here's the law. Now, if this represents God, if that's what that represents, then where's the law? In God. God is the law. God is from where all our laws come from. God 
doesn't answer to somebody and have to make laws according to some constitution that that is written and that that God has to uh, give heed to, like you and I do. But the laws come directly from God. They're they're from God. So when we break the law, we're breaking one of God's attitudes or one of God's characteristics or one of God's attributes. And that's what it means to break the law, that the laws were given to us to help us represent and understand who God is. And so that's why it says in verse in verse nine, Moses put uh, put there at Horeb, which the Lord God made, where the Lord God made a covenant with the sons of Israel when they came out, out of the land of Egypt. So the law remained in there, but the rod and the, and, and the manna did not remain in there. Uh, and so in verse 10, it says, it happened that when the priest came from the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord. So as the priest went in here, put all of the utensils, all of the furnishings, everything that was supposed to go in there, then you had this cloud, this uh, uh, Shekinah that filled, make a better cloud here, that filled the temple. And so this whole temple was filled when the priest came out. In other words, what that's showing us is that God was coming into his house. And so it says in verse 11, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory, the second of the Lord filled the house. And so it's, it's interesting that as you have this, this house that's being dedicated here, you have the fact that how do you know that God actually approves of this house? Because you, you saw him come. You saw the glory of the Lord come over here. Well, today, God has a house today. God's house today is his church. Okay? It's his people. And over here in the New Testament, how do we know that God is in his house? He gave us the Holy Spirit. That's what you have, that's what you have filling this this room here is you have God's glory, you have God's spirit filling the room over there to indicate that God is now going to live in there. And over here, God comes along and he fills his people with his spirit in Acts chapter two to indicate that, that he now is living in his new temple. And that new temple you and I call the church or the believers. That's, who, that's the temple of God today. God doesn't have a physical temple like he did over here. This is a type the, the temple that, that Solomon was building was a type of this temple over here. And so you have God's people over here in, in, the, in God's church, which is his temple. And you know that God is dealing in his temple because he gave them the Holy Spirit. And, and God did that to prove to them that they are God's church. Now, uh, how many times did, did God's glory have to fill this temple for them to know God lived there? One time. He didn't do it every generation. He didn't do it when somebody was born and say, oh, I got to make sure this person knows. He did it one time. And he expected then people to be able to transmit that fact to other generations. Well, how about in the New Testament? How many times does God have to fill his church? One time. He does it one time. What are we supposed to do if we're these people that are in this church? We're supposed to tell other people that God has filled his church. Okay, because you know there's people that came into this temple that didn't see that the Shekinah come. They didn't see that come, but they were to have the same respect as the people who saw it because they were supposed to be taught that God lived in there. And the way we know God lived in there is because he gave us the, the uh, Shekinah. And that's what, that's what you have over here. God's Holy Spirit coming down on the apostles proves that God is living or dealing with his or dwelling in his temple, which is the church. And so that's the same pattern that you have here, although over here you have it in a physical way that God demonstrated that, that by some visual means, just like God demonstrated the fact that he's now with his people uh, in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came down and there was the fire over their heads and they spoke in tongues and they did things that only somebody could do if God was with them. And, and so that's the... That's, the, the establishing of the temple that's getting it ready, that's getting it all set up. And so God comes and basically God approves of it by, by living in it. Now, the other thing is you and I, being God's temple, are supposed to show the glory of God. Right? Matthew chapter 5, and I believe it's verse 16 or 17 says, uh, 
that you're the light of the world. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So just like this temple glorified God, God's church today is supposed to glorify him. And the way we glorify him is by doing the, the, the good works, the works that God would do. Just like Jesus did when Jesus came here. Now, that doesn't mean you and I have to run around doing miracles, but Jesus glorified God even when he didn't have the Holy Spirit and, and wasn't able to do miracles. He still glorified God by the things that he did. All right. Anything, anything on that so far? All right. Verse 12. It says, then Solomon said, the Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick cloud. I have surely built you a lofty house, a place for your dwelling forever. Then the king faced about and blessed all the assembly of Israel while all the assembly of Israel was standing. And he said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who spoke with his mouth by my father, David, and has fulfilled it with his hand, saying, since the, since the day that I brought my people Israel from, from Egypt, I did not choose a city. I did not choose a city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house that I, that my name might be there. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. Now, now it, it was in the heart of my father David to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, because it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build a house, but your son who will be born to you, he will build the house for my name. Now the Lord has fulfilled his word, which he spoke, for I have risen in place of my father David and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised and have built the house for the name of the, uh, of the Lord, the God of Israel. There I have set, there I have set a place for the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord, which he made with our fathers when he brought them from the land of Egypt. And so basically Solomon, as he notices that God fills the house, he then uh, takes that to, me, uh, to indicate that, go that God was pleased with the house and therefore he's fulfilling what God said. And that is that God promised to David that he would build a house where God would dwell there forever. Now notice this expression, verse 13, he says, I have surely built you a lofty house, a place for your dwelling forever. And so it says that he's supposed to dwell in this house forever. Well, does God live in this house? No. Then, then forever might not mean what we think forever means uh, in, this, in this context. Uh, but he then points out in verse 14, he, he says, that then, the king, uh, then the king faced about and blessed all the assembly. And so he's bl blessing the assembly. And basically what he tells them in verse 15, because I'm not going to reread all this, in verse 15 is that he's fulfilled what God promised to his father David. And you remember that God promised to David that he would have a kingdom, and one of his descendants would sit on his throne and would build him a house, and that house would never be destroyed, right? What happened to this house? It got destroyed. So Solomon is a type of Jesus. Solomon says that he's fulfilled it because Solomon's thinking he's the son who's supposed to build this house. But this house that he built gets destroyed. This, matter of fact, this, this temple, by the time Jesus comes over here, I think, that's, I, I think that's the fourth temple that the children of Israel have had. From the time that God gave them the temple over here to the time that Jesus comes, I believe that's their fourth temple, okay? And so uh, uh, David, uh, or um, uh, Solomon seems to think that he's the fulfillment of that. And so in a sense, in a type, he is. In a type, he is a sense of the fulfillment, but he's not truly the fulfillment uh, in reality. And so in, in verses 16, uh, then he points out that the reason that God, uh, that David wanted to, to build that house was to put God's name there. And remember, I've talked to you about the idea of a name. This, this structure should tell you something about the name of God. Okay, by looking at that structure, it should tell you something about the name of God. Uh, it's, it, it's made of gold, so it's precious, right? It's made of cedar wood, so it's fragrant. Uh, it's, it has gold overlaid in it with, with uh, uh, 
places to sacrifice and show bread. And it's the place where you go in order to find mercy from God, and in order to have fellowship with God. And that should tell you something about God's name. Well, today, all of that rests in Jesus. Jesus is the one who, who gives us salvation. Jesus is the one who we find mercy from. Jesus is, where the, is the one who really paid the price of the mercy seat. Jesus is precious. Jesus is. And so this house, it, it, it represents Jesus uh, in the sense that when Jesus tabernacled down here, he was living in a house. And so from that standpoint, but in, rela in relationship to the church, God's church is supposed to be precious to God. It's a, it's a precious group of people. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says the world is not worthy of these people. Uh, that's what he points out. And so uh, Jesus is where God has placed his name today. And, it, and in God's house, uh, and it, or, or remember the church is God's body. So in God's body is where uh, Jesus placed the glory because you and I are supposed to give glory to God. And so uh, all of that is kind of this figure and this type that's under consideration. And so he was going to place his name in that, in that tabernacle. Um, and, and, and then he, he says that he wasn't allowed to build it, that David wasn't allowed to build it, but, but Solomon was. And that's why verse 20 says, now the Lord has fulfilled his word, which he spoke, for I have, I have uh, risen in place of my father David and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised and have built the house for the name of the, of the Lord, the God of Israel. So that house was supposed to be for, for the Lord. It was to represent him. It was supposed to be a place where they could go and learn stuff about God and understand who God is. And, and, but the problem is they turned it into an idol, basically. They turned the temple into an idol, and rather than looking at the temple, what it was supposed to do for them, they turned it into an idol uh, and something that they were keeping to indicate that, that they were pleasing to the God who owned that idol. And so uh, that's what happens a lot of times, and that happens today in the church, too. Some, pe some people have the idea that you got to find the right group of people. If you don't find the right group of people, then you know you're, you're not uh, among uh, you're not among God's people, and so they turn the church, they turn uh, um, a system into an idol instead of understanding that that God gave us these rules and and, and principles so that we could learn about Him and teach it to other people. All right, Any, anything on that? Yes, sir. Right. Right. That's right. God was with them, mm -hmm. and God is with you. If you're fo if you're following Jesus, if you've been baptized in his name, then God is with you, and, and you're with God, and He's leading you. He's, you, we're, he's supposed to dwell in us. He's supposed to lead us. He's supposed to be the one who rules us. All right, verse 22. It says, Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands towards heaven. He said, O Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenants and showing loving kindness to his servants who walk before you with all their heart, who have kept uh, with your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, indeed, you have spoken with your mouth and have fulfilled it with your hands as it is this day. So we're going to take part of this prayer to time because I don't want to go back and reread it over again. And so one of the things that he points out is as he begins this is, you know, he does what you and I can't do. And that is that, that Solomon raises his hands to God. See, we don't do that. The denominations do that. The, the, those people that are... are Rather, we're, they're, the, we, they're the ones that do. We don't raise our hand. Why not? Why don't we raise our hands? There's no reason why we don't raise our hands. Timothy says, lift up, uh, lift up holy hands to the Lord. We're supposed to lift up holy hands. What? No, lifting up holy hands is dad. Can you pick me up, please? I'm a little kid. I need you to pick me up. So we, we spread out our hands to our father so he'll pick us up. That's the idea of holding up your hands. It's not, I'm holding up my hands so you can see me. Look, I'm holding up my hands. No, it's, it's God, I need your help. 
come, come over here and help me. There's absolutely nothing wrong as far as I know in the New Testament where we can't lift up holy hands to God. Now, if you're doing it just for the purpose of going, hey, look at me, I'm lifting up my hand. Well, then that's just as wrong as you wanting to pray so everybody can see you. It's, that's just the same thing. But if you're honestly lifting up your hands to God, because God, I need your help, there's nothing wrong with that. But because of our upbringing and our cultures, our religious culture sometimes, we look at those things and say, other churches do that, and we're not like them, so we're not going to do that. Well, just because another group does it doesn't mean it's wrong, doesn't mean it's right. It depends on what God says. And so Solomon was lifting up holy hands. And he says uh, in verse 23, and he says, Oh, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven and, and uh, above and on earth beneath who keeps covenants and shows loving kindness to his servants who walk before him with all their heart. Now, notice the notice the 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 condition for, for God to bless them. They have to be walking with the Lord with their heart, with their whole heart. They have to be walking with the Lord. Uh, and it says in verse 24, who have kept your, your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, indeed you have spoken with your mouth and have, have fulfilled it with your hands as it is, as it is this day. So, so Solomon is looking at the, the uh, type of what Jesus was going to do. And he's looking at himself as the type, and he's saying, we'll fulfill that in building this temple. Um, and so he also points out in verse 25 that God promises to keep his, the, the throne to Israel or to, to David if they walk before me, if they walk before God, okay, as David walked. Now, uh, Solomon says that, but what happens right here? In the reign of Solomon, what happens? He stopped walking with God, right? So God divided the kingdom, right? He, he, he tore the kingdom in half. And we'll talk about that later. And so Solomon didn't even heed his own warning. Uh, but that is the condition. The condition is if we serve God, then uh, God's king will rule over us forever. Now, verse 26. Now, therefore, uh, O God of Israel, let your word, I pray, be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant, my father David. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house which I built. So here's what I want to understand. They, Solomon is building this house, but as Solomon dedicates the temple and as he's praying to God, he says, I know that God can't live in this house. I know that God can't fit in there. God can't fit in this house. God, God can't fit in there. Now, sometimes people come over here and they want Jesus to fit in them. They want Jesus to be inside of them. Well, just like God says he's going to dwell in here is how he dwells in his church. Okay, he, He's going to dwell in here from the standpoint that, that it's a spiritual dwelling. He's physically not there. Well, how's he going to dwell over here in the church? He's going to dwell with them in a spiritual way. He's going to dwell with them according to whether they listen to what he says and follow his word. But Solomon starts off by saying, God doesn't live in here. God can't live in there. Okay. Uh, he says, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heavens and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house which I have built? Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to listen to the cry and to the prayer which your servants pray before you today, that the eyes, that your eyes may be open towards this house night and day, towards the place of which you have said, my name shall be there, to listen to the prayers which your servants shall pray towards this place. So what Solomon does say is, I know you don't live here. I know you don't live here. But when we pray to this place, When we pray towards that place, you hear in, sorry, you hear in heaven. You hear it in heaven. So if you pray towards this place, he's going to hear it in heaven. Well, if he's living in here, why does he have to hear it in heaven? 
If you prayed to this place, he would hear it in here. Solomon says, he doesn't live here. Yeah, but he doesn't live here. He never has lived here. God can't, can't live in there, right? He can rule over it, but it says he lives in heaven because the, the, our, our universe can't, can't contain God. Uh, and so in verse, verse uh, 29, he says that your eyes may be open towards this house night and day, um, towards the place of which you have said, my name shall be there. Now over here in the New Testament, Jesus said to his disciples that they have, had, had never asked anything in the name of Jesus. But he says, there's going to come a day when you do ask in the name of Jesus. When's that going to be? When he dies and is resurrected and sends down the Holy Spirit, then they baptize people in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't mean you can't baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's all the same name. But what he's pointing out is that, that, you, that, that the place where we go to is, is the name of God. That's, that's the place we go to uh, in order to find uh, God listening to us. So if you want to pray to God, you have to pray through Jesus because he's, he's the one who has the name of God. And he's the one that came, came down here. Uh, and then he says, in verse 30, listen to the supplications of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place, here in heaven, your dwelling place, hear and forgive. So he says, I, I know that you really live in heaven. That's where you really live. But when you pray to this place, I want you to hear us. Okay? Now, uh, so, so my question is, once this temple was built, did the Gentiles over here, did the Gentiles have to pray to this place? No, they didn't have to pray to this place. They might not even know about this place. Okay, but if they had a relationship with God, they just pray to God. And that's why Jesus said to the woman at the well, when she said, are we supposed to, you say we're supposed to uh, worship in this mountain, but we say we're supposed to worship in Samaria. And Jesus says, the hour is coming and now is when the true worship of worship God in spirit and in truth. God isn't worried about where you're worshiping, God is worried about who you're worshiping. That's what's under consideration, yes. The woman at the well was more enlightened about who Jesus is and who was to come than the scribes and Pharisees who denied him. Right, exactly. Uh, that, that's exactly right. Okay, and so um, uh, basically he, he, he's telling them or he's saying to them, uh, if we pray to this place because this is where your name is and this is the Jews who are God's people and that's the way it is, that's a picture for us too. We're over here at the church and we pray through Jesus because we're, we're his people, okay? And, and so that's, that's what's under consideration there. Or that's the type that you might say there. Now, in verse 31, he says, if a man sins against his neighbor and is made, made to take an oath and he comes and takes an oath before your altar in this house, then uh, here in heaven and act and judge your servants condemned, uh, condemning the wicked by bringing his way on his own head and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. So here, he, here he's talking about what you and I would call swearing. And he says, if a man sins against his neighbor and, and made to take an oath, so he ha he's going to take an oath, okay? And he comes and takes an oath before, before your altar in this house, then here in heaven. Okay, and so here, here's the idea. And so God condemned the wicked and bring his, bring his, his judgment on him and justify the righteous. So if there's somebody who comes and they, and they make a, an oath, but he's lying, then what's God going to do? Punish him. But if he keeps his oath, what's God going to do? Bless him. So the idea of, of, making, of making an oath isn't something that 
that God didn't want. God had to make oath. God had to make promises or vows. You make a promise. Uh, if you get married, you make your vows. It's, it's kind of funny that people will have no problem making vows when, in their wedding, but for some reason they think they can't make a vow to anybody else. And it's the same principle. And that is, if you're, if you're making a vow and you're part of God's people, you need to keep it. That's the main thing that he's telling us there. Now, uh, it says in verse, verse 33, when your people Israel are defeated before an enemy because they have sinned against you, if, if they turn to you again and confess your name and pray and make supplication to you in this house, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land which you uh, gave uh, to their fathers. And so, and so now he points out what happens if we get, if we get overrun by an enemy because we've been unfaithful. Well, if they pray to this house, God will forgive them. Well, that's just the same thing over here in the church. If you are, and I are in the church and we, we sin, then we pray to God. We pray to Jesus because he is God in the flesh. We pray, we pray to him and, and through him, and we can find forgiveness of sin uh, in him. And so again, he says here in heaven. Uh, okay. Now, verse 35. When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you and they pray towards this place and confess your name and turn from their sins uh, when, uh, when you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants and of your people Israel. Indeed, teach them the good way in which they should walk and send rain on your land, which you, which you have given your people as an inheritance. And so basically he, he tells them, that if God punishes them by closing up the sky. Now, what's interesting is a lot of the things that he lists here are the curses that he listed over here when he gave them the book of Deuteronomy. In the book of Deuteronomy, he said that if they sinned, they would have all these curses come upon them. And these are some of the curses. They would be overrun by their enemy. That sin, sin would become, uh, would conquer them. Uh, God would close up the 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 rain and make the ground hard so they wouldn't have any food. And so these are things that God said was a result of the curse. And what God's saying is, is that if you're faithful to him, e even though God might have cursed you at one time, if you come to him and turn to him, he can always forgive you. And you can find forgiveness in here. So never give up on God. We, when somebody sins and they don't come back to God, they haven't given up on God. They've given up on themselves. Because God says, if you sin, come to me and I'll forgive you. But if you stay away, then you're not going to be forgiven. Just come back to me and, and God will take care of you. God will forgive you. And so that's what he's pointing out here. Uh, and, and that's what he's telling them, that if you come back to me, then God will send the rain on his inheritance, okay, which, which God has given to us. Now, verse 37, if there is a famine in the land. If there is pestilence, if there is blithe or mildew, locusts, uh, grasshoppers, uh, if, if their enemy besieges them in the land of their cities, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is, whatever, whenever, uh, whatever prayer or supplication is made by any man or by all your people Israel, each knowing the affliction of his own heart and spreading his hands towards this house, then here in heaven your dwelling place and forgive and act and, and render to each according to all his ways, whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of all uh, the sons of men. Let me move this down so I can read it. Uh, that they may fear you all the days that they live in the land which you have given to our fathers. Now, I want you to notice a, a couple of things in, in this reading. So now he just lists a bunch of the curses that were over in Deuteronomy. I believe the curses are in Deuteronomy 28, if I remember right, uh, or, or maybe they're in, in Leviticus. Um, I, I know they're in Deuteronomy 28, and they're also in Leviticus 26 is where they're found. But he, he lists a bunch of the other curses, mildew, pestilence, uh, besieged by your enemies, locust plague, uh, uh, sicknesses, whatever. So he's saying whatever plagues you, if you come to understand who God is and you come back to him and you repent and you come and confess him and you turn to this house, you pray towards this house, then God will hear you in heaven and whatever your heart needs, God will give it to you. And then verse 40 says that you may fear all the days of you, uh, all the days that uh, they live in the land. 
Now, this idea of fear is not the idea of terror. This idea of fear is, is uh, uh, awe or reverence. It's awe or reverence. When we understand that God wants to forgive us, we hold God in awe. We hold God in reverence. That here's a God that loves us so much, he's willing to forgive us, and he's willing to take us back. And we're in awe of that. We're, we're, we have a different attitude towards God than we do people. And that's this idea of fear. It's not God will forgive you, but you better be afraid and terrorized of him. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the sense of awe that was felt by the New Testament church in Acts chapter 2 and verse uh, 42, 43, and 44. Uh, when they held God in awe, in reverence. And so that's what's in consideration. Now verse 41. He says, also concerning the, concerning the foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, when he comes from a far country for your name's sake, uh, they will hear of your great name and your, and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm when he comes and prays towards this house, here in heaven, your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name to fear you as do your people Israel, that they may know that this house, which I have built, is called by my name. So uh, um, Solomon also says, by the way, these blessings aren't just for us. These blessings are for foreigners. If foreigners will come and pray to this place, then God will bless them. Now, that doesn't mean that God won't bless people who don't come to this place, but it's just showing, it's showing uh, us that God is not partial. God is not telling the Jews one thing and the foreigners, they have to do something different. If the foreigners come and they live in the land of Israel and they pray to this place, God will hear them just like he will hear the, uh, na the national Jew. Uh, and so that's what he's pointing out, that God is going to, to bless everybody uh, as he does that. And we talked Sunday about the fact that when Jesus was talking about being the good shepherd, he says he has one flock and he has to bring the other sheep into it. Well, the sheep that were originally there were the Jews. They were his sheep. The, the sheep that he's bringing in would be the Gentiles in order to make one flock and one fold. Uh, and, and that's what you have going on here. This principle wasn't an, an, a New Testament principle. It was an Old Testament principle. And so when Peter said in Acts chapter 10, now I, now I know that God is not a respecter of persons, he wasn't saying that God all of a sudden now be, didn't become a respecter of persons. Peter was saying, I figured it out. I figured out that God is not a respecter of persons. I now understand God no, not a respecter of persons. And not that he was at one time, and now he's not. He never has been a respecter of persons. And so God says, if a foreigner prays, then you're going to hear him also as well. Now, verse 46, he says, when they sin against you, uh, I'm sorry, 44. Okay, yeah, when your people go out to battle against their enemy by, by uh, whatever way you send, send them, and they pray to the Lord towards the city, which you have chosen and the house which I have built for your name, then hear in heaven your prayer and your supplication and maintain their cause. When they sin against you, uh, for there is uh, no man who does not sin, and you are angry with them and deliver them to an enemy so that they may uh, take them uh, away captive to the land of their enemies so far uh, off or near. If they take thought in the land which they have been taken captive and repent and make supplication to you in the land of those who have taken them captive, saying we have sinned and have committed iniquity, we have acted wickedly. If they turn, return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemy who have taken them captive and pray to you towards this land which you have given to their fathers, the city which you have chosen and the house which I have built for your name. Then hear their prayer and their supplication in, in heaven, your dwelling place, and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you uh, and all their transgressions, which they have transgressed against you, and make them objects of compassion before, uh, before those who have taken them captive, that they may have compassion on them, for uh, they are your people and your inheritance which you have brought forth from Egypt 
from the midst of the iron furnace, that your eyes may be open to the supplication of your servants and to the supplication of your people Israel to listen to them whenever they call to you, for you have separated them from all the peoples of the earth as their inheritance, as your inheritance, as you spoke through Moses, your servant, when he brought out our fathers forth from Egypt, O Lord God. And so he talks about the fact that when they go off into captivity, so again, he's going through all of the curses that you find in Deuteronomy, and he's saying that when those curses come upon you and you pray to this place, God will forgive you. And he talks specifically in here about them going off into captivity. If you remember when Daniel was, was in, uh, we have the book of Daniel, where was he? He was in Babylon captivity, right? But whenever he prayed, it said he would open his windows and pray towards Jerusalem. That's where he would pray towards. He would pray towards the house. And God heard him. God heard his prayer, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So even though Israel had been taken off into captivity, they could, from where they're at up there, respond and, and turn to God. And God would forgive them if they would pray towards this place. Okay? Now, uh, what, what does that tell us? Well, it also tells us that if you're over here, and it just so happens that you get captivated by addiction, or some sin grabs you and holds you, God says, I'll forgive you. You can pray towards me. Even if you're in the middle of that sin, you can pray towards me and I will deliver you. See, I think part of our problem is that we think we have to clear up our sin first, then we can come to God. These people over here were in captivity. They didn't come out of captivity and then pray to God. They prayed to God in their captivity and God heard them. And over here, if you're struggling with an addiction, come to God. Pray to God. Ask God to help you. God, God wants to help you. God will help you. But if you're waiting to clean yourself up and then come to God, or you got to, you know, repent of everything first so the church will accept you, then you misunderstand who it is that's going to save you and who's going to forgive you. God, God wants us to know that if you're in captivity, you can pray to him and he will deliver you. He will take you out of that captivity. Our problem is we think we're the ones who deliver ourselves out of captivity. And after we've done so, then we can come to God and God will forgive us because of some good, great action that we have accomplished and we have done. And that's really not what it's about. It's about what God does for us. And then one more thing I want you to notice here, since we were looking at the book of Ephesians on, on Wednesday, I want you to look at verse 53. It says, for you have separated them, talking about Israel, from all the peoples of the earth as your inheritance. See, God says, I'm getting something out of the world. What I'm getting out of the world is my faithful people. That's what I'm going to get. We become God's inheritance. So in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 14, when he says we have obtained to an inheritance, it doesn't mean you get an inheritance. It means you are an inheritance. It means you are what God is going to get. Yes, we certainly, there are other references that talk about us getting an inheritance, but in Ephesians, he's talking about us obtaining to God's inheritance, to us becoming the inheritance of God. We are what God gets. We belong to God. That's the point. We belong to God, and that's what he's going to get, and that's why, that's why he's willing to forgive these people, because they are what's going to belong to him, and so you and I, in Jesus, are predestined to holiness and blamelessness, not through our own efforts, but through the work of God in Jesus. All right, verse uh, 54. Let's see if we can't finish this up here. Pretty long chapter, if you notice. All right, 54. It says, when Solomon had finished praying these in, uh, this entire prayer and supplication of the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his, wait a minute, kneeling? Catholics kneel. We don't kneel. Oh, they have benches that they kneel on. Well, we don't kneel. We stand because we're so dignified. They kneeled. They got down on their knees, raised their hands to God, looked like little kids. Why, wow, that's not very sophisticated. That's not very intellectual doing that. They, they, they weren't concerned about how they looked. They were concerned about their relationship with God. And so he was on his knees. And by the way, the New Testament tells us that Paul prayed on his knees when he was being escorted out uh, before he went on his 
his last uh, missionary journey. Now, uh, verse, verse 55. And he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice saying, Blessed be the God who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he has promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promises, which he promised through Moses' servant. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us nor, or forsake us, for he, uh, for he may incline our hearts to himself, that he may incline uh, our hearts to himself, to walk in all his ways and to keep his, his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances, which he commanded to our fathers. And, oops, oh, sorry, let me go back here. I messed up my paper here. Thank you, 59. Clicked on the wrong thing, 59. And, and, and may these words of mine, with which I have made supplication before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God, uh, our God, day and night, that he may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel as as each day requires, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God, there is no one else. Let your heart, therefore, be wholly devoted to the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments at, as at this day. And so he, in this last little section, uh, uh, Solomon is basically blessing the people and giving his benediction, and as he does that, uh, he he it says in verse 56, blessed be the God who gave rest to his people. And in verse 57, he says, may the Lord our God be with us. And so he says, may the Lord continue with us. Uh, as long as we're inclined to serve him, he's going to be inclined to be with us. And then in, in verse 59, he says, and may these words of mine, with which I have made supplication before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God, a day and night, that he may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel as each day requires. In other words, what, what Solomon is saying is, is the Lord is going to bless us and give us what we need as long as we're faithful to him. And now verse 60, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God. Now, how is it that all the people of the earth are going to know that the Lord is God? Let me repeat my question for, for those of you that are asleep. How, how is the are the people going to know that the Lord is our uh, that the Lord is God? I'm sorry, what? Well, it's when the people keep their word to God. It's when the people are faithful to God, then the world is going to know there's a God. Jesus says, "By this, all men will know you're my disciples." By what? By love. If you love one another, then the, the world will know you're my disciples. That's how they're going to know that there's a God. Okay? And so, therefore, he says, so that all the peoples of the earth may know the, the Lord is God, there is no one else. Israel was supposed to be a light to the world by how they respected God and, therefore, would bring other people to him. Verse 61, let your heart, therefore, be wholly devoted to the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. Now, we're going to have a list of all the sacrifices that Solomon sacrificed. And so it says in verse 62, now the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifice before the Lord. Solomon offered for the sacrifice of peace offering, which he offered to the Lord, 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the sons of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. So that's 142,000 animals that were offered. Okay. On the same day, the king consecrated the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, because there he offered the burnt offerings and the grain offerings and the fat of the peace offerings for the bronze altar that was before the Lord was too small to hold the burnt offerings and the grain offerings and the fat of the, of the peace offerings. So basically what it says is Solomon offered so many sacrifices that the, the altar that was inside, the altar that was inside the ark over here, remember the altar's here, and over here is the, the uh, 
laver, the, the, the great sea, they called it. This was so small that they had to make other altars. They had to make other places in the courtyard where they could offer sacrifices because how long would it take you to offer uh, 144,000 animals? It'd take, it take you quite a while. Now, I, I believe this happened over the course of seven days, but nonetheless, it would take you a long time. Um, and, and so he offered the peace offering and the fat offering. Now verse 65, he says, so Solomon observed the feast at that time and all Israel with him, a great assembly from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt before the Lord our God for seven days and seven more days, even 14 days. So this all took place in, in, within 14 days. Now the number seven is the idea for complete. And when you repeat it, it's, it's something that's done, a two represents the idea of strength. Represents the idea of strength. And, and so you have it, it, this temple completely built, and then you had them offer these sacrifices and peace offerings, which meant that they were forgiven by God, and they could eat with God, commune with God, fellowship with God, and God would be with them and dwell with them. And so they had that for 14 days. And remember that when it talks about the sacrifices, they also offered peace offerings. And what did you do with the peace offerings? You ate them. So people were having a barbecue all this time. All this time they're eating this meat that's been sacrificed and all the people are taking part of it. That's why there was so many. That's why there was so much stuff being offered because they were, they were communing with all the people. That's kind of like on the, on the Lord's day. How much unleavened bread do you think is eaten worldwide? Lots, right? Well, that's what's going on here. And so it's not that Solomon did all this just so his extravagance. He was doing all this so that everybody could take part in the fellowship of God, so that everybody could eat some of the peace offering because their sins had been forgiven, because they now had a place where the name of God was represented, and they could come there, and God would have fellowship with them and eat with them. And I, I suggest to you that that's what's really what's under consideration over here in Acts chapter 2. And down here at verse, when the church was established, down here at verse, at verse 42, uh, at verse 42, it says, uh, speaking about the church, and they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. The idea with breaking of bread was to have fellowship with God. And that's why in, in verse 20, 46, it says, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And so those individuals that New Testament church were looked at different than the religious Jewish system that had been there previously uh, that Jesus basically spoke against. And so that's what you have down here. Um, Right. Mm -hmm. So we have to recognize the sin in order to repent and ask for forgiveness. Right. And people out of the world don't know they're sinning many times because it's been accepted by the church. That's right. That's exactly right. Verse 66. On the eighth day, he sent, First uh, Kings 8, 66. On the eighth day, he sent the people away and they blessed the king. Then they went to their tents joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had shown to David, his servant, and to Israel, his people. So when this house was first built, what was the attitude of the people when they left? It was joyful. It's great to have God in our midst. It's great, it's great to have God's house here. How, how did the New Testament church respond in Acts chapter 2? They praised God, and they were joyful. Not, oh, I got to go to church. <laughs> oh, but I don't go. The preacher's going to call me and be upset with me. Hope yeah, I hope he doesn't preach over. <laughs> it's supposed to be a joyful response to God. God's living with us. We get to live with God. How much more wonderful can that be? That's why Brother Leroy gets up and says, even though I'm in all this hurt and all this pain, 
So it's good to see you all. Glad to be here. Couldn't be in a better place. And so it represents the fellowship that we have with God. And that's why I like us. Because we like to be here and we like to, to be happy with one another and share the blessings of God. Yes. That's right. Rejoice in the Lord always, right? Not rejoice in your money or not rejoice in what you possess. Rejoice in the Lord always. All right. So we got that chapter done. That's a pretty long chapter. Anything, anything else anybody would like to say or mention? We'll start with chapter nine next week. Yes, Albert. For the ark, huh? Right. As a, right. Well, well, the difference the difference with that is that the Philistines didn't know they weren't supposed to carry the ark, so God allowed them to carry the ark without them being being punished. Because not only that, He was bringing judgment on Judah because of their sin, but when Judah went to go get the ark, when Israel went to go get the ark back. They're supposed to know. And so, therefore, when they came and took the ark and Uzza tripped, or uh, um, sorry, Uzza touched the ark because the ark was, thought he, he thought it was going to fall because the oxen stumbled and he held his hand up there and he touched it, he should have known better. So, one of the things that that tells us is that God deals with us according to the knowledge that we have. We like to think that God deals with us according to the knowledge I have. And so, if you don't have the knowledge I have, then God can't deal with you. But God deals with us according to the knowledge we have. And so that's what you have going on there. Yes. Yes. Yes, and, that, and, and you're right. It, we would instinctively want to catch it if we were animals. Because that's what animals act. Animals act out of instinct. We're not supposed to do anything out of instinct. We're supposed to do stuff because we know it's right to do it. Yes. Right. Right. That's right. If a child of two... Uh, happens to hit their parent and a child of 20 hits their parent, there's a big difference, isn't there? That's right. There's a big difference. So God judges us according to the knowledge that we have. And, and God is, is a just, fair God. So, so God is going to do what's right. Uh, all right. Anything, anything else? Yes, Chad. Because Indiana Jones was there. <laughs> No, I have no idea. Like I said, we have no record of, of, of how anything could be taken out of the ark, why it was taken out. And, and maybe that's the reason why uh, the Philistines had such problems with the plague that they had, was maybe because they were the ones that took it out. But we don't know who took it out. All we know is by this time uh, that Solomon built his temple, the only thing left in there was the laws of God, which is really interesting that they took the other stuff that they might find useful but they didn't take God's law. And, that, and that's what should have been useful. What should have been useful is God's law. But, it, but that's interesting. Yeah, but to answer your question, we don't really know. Yes. You know, David ate bread. Yeah, David ate show bread at one time or another. Yeah. Right. No, no, Indiana Jones has it, remember? You've got to put in that big warehouse. And and the government has it hidden in you know in area fifty what is it, 53? 50 oh area fifty one yeah that's where it's at yes sir okay oh. Secondly, I got a phone call to say, and she said that small amount of liquid that was on George's 
was equivalent to five cups. Wow. That they drank it too clearly, much better. The only chance we used on the antibiotics, but it was not a lot. Great. Super. Yes. Elaine, did you have some? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, let's have a prayer. We'll be dismissed. <clears throat> Lord God and Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the shadows and types that you have placed in the Old Testament to help us know more about you and how you care about us and what you want from us and how much you love us, Father. We pray that we might love you and that we might hold you in awe and in reverence and fear. We pray, Father, that you would continue to do what Solomon's prayer says, and that is that when we pray towards where you placed your name, in our case, that's Jesus, that you might hear us, Father, whether we've been captured in sin or whether we are suffering physically or spiritually, Father, we pray that you would answer our prayer and that you would give us what it is that we need. We lift our hands to you, Father, and we know that you're the one who loves us and cares for us. So we pray that you would look down upon us and bless us as your people. And as always, forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.